I mean, what's happening? Patron, Patreons, this is a very special uh, Patreon episode, patron, Patreon only episode of the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And uh, we are going to bring on our guest, Mr. Paris Mayhew. Here you go. What's up, man? Hey, Drew. Let's just cut right to it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right? Let's. <laughs> Why there, bullshit around? There's no gigs um, you required. I, I yeah, I, listen, I, I, hey, years. you know, there you go. Um, well, so you have uh, you have a new track out there with a new video, and I thought it would be great to bring you on and let's kind of go through it and let's break it down. Um, you know, as we go, uh, you know, uh, you know, as it goes, I'll pause it and and uh, ask some questions, and, and you just give give us some perspective on it. Does that make sense? No, it's great because it's so fresh. I just finished editing for 28 hours straight. So, and then slept for 15 hours. 28 hours. All right. And well, that, let's. I mean, that wasn't the entire editing. That was just the ending it. That was just finishing it up. <laughs> I mean, I, All I, right. I first started shooting it about eight months ago. And then All I right, let's, let's get a bite on it. Let's get let's a bite get on it. Here we go. <laughs> You can stop right there because there's so much in that beginning. All right, all right. So, so let me let me let me just start with saying that yeah, the first two shots that I shot were the skateboard shot and the bike shot. Which the skateboard uh, shot? Uh, that skateboard shot? Yeah, and no, not that one. The the first one, and then the bike shot. That one? Yeah, because I was. Trying to I was trying to get a handle on what I wanted to do for the video, and I knew I wanted it to feel like it was the same night as Chaos Magic, and I wanted, does. That works. I wanted it to be like skate with skateboarding in it, but I didn't want it to be a skateboarding video. So I was mm -hmm. trying to think of a way to capture skateboarding without it being like a TikTok trick, you know, because you can't compete with these TikTok kids and their tricks. They're phenomenal. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something more like because skateboarding is more like a New York lifestyle thing, riding around. Because my whole thing is I discovered the hardcore scene skateboarding around in the middle of the night i first saw a a7 skateboarding to to the park in tavern when i was 14. you know i would just go out at night and do that and that's kind of what i wanted to capture and those two shots the bike shot sorry i covered my bike with lights like blue and red lights and and those two shots really kind of define the color palette of the video that i wanted this this one excuse me this And this one? Yeah. I put yeah. the red lights and, you know, and the blue lights and, and just the whole red, blue, yellow kind of primary color thing was the way I went with it. And I even, in the very next shots where you see me appear three times. Right there. I even dress like, you know, I wore that blue shirt. I had the red guitar, uh -huh. the yellow graffiti. I tried to keep that color palette throughout the entire video. It was all dictated by that first bike shot. And like you, like you said, it definitely has the feel that it's a continuation of the narrative from, from the first, from the first video. Yeah. It yeah, feels like. I try to explain that to, to a large extent, the the video the way i make them look is i want them to feel like my memories not a memory of a specific um thing that happened but more the way my memories look in my head like when i look back at my you know my youth in new york city you know and i think new york seven new york city 1975 that's what i that's what it looked like to me and so like i said it's not so much a specific memory of an event that happened it's just basically the way i remember the city New York City's definitely slipping back into the 70s, man. 
Well, you know, and the other thing that's like a major part of that is, you know, like there's a lot of cityscape shots in the video. And it yeah. was very, very difficult to accomplish those shots for the primary reason that the city has been retrofitted with LED lights. And these LED lights that, that light up all the streets, they don't have caps on them. It's just, they're just like this harsh, horrible light. So yeah. if you set up a camera and try to do a shot, those lights are so bright that they that there's so much noise that you can't see everything that's above it. It's like not the New York City of our past where you could just spend your time looking up. That was another thing I did in the video that I really did conspicuously is in New York, as New Yorkers walking around, we spend most of our time looking up, looking up at buildings that we'll never be in, looking up at homes that we'll never live in. You know, at least that was my experience. And this yeah. whole, I, I wanted all the shots, especially of the projections I did, to be like looking up through fences, looking up, because that's what we did. We spent our lives looking at the city by looking up. I thought maybe it would be cool to have drones over the city. And I thought, no, that's not the way a New Yorker sees the city. The city, the New Yorker looks up. And that, you know, and I know that sounds like a kind of an abstract thing, but the look of the video is very much from a New Yorker's point of view, looking up at the buildings. And, Absolutely. Let's uh, look at some more. Who's this kid? That's my nephew, John Mayhew, my brother's son. I saw, I saw in the credits John Mayhew, and I was thinking, John Mayhew, who, who? I'm think, I, I didn't think that that could have been him. Yeah, that's him. You know, I was waiting for someone to be like, oh, you know, like Paris hired a model to be like the actor. And I was like, no, he was living downstairs in my, uh, in my, in my. He just moved to New York from San Diego, and he was. Uh, this is my house, and uh, I have an apartment downstairs that I rent, Airbnb, and. He lived there for two months while he was looking for an apartment. Is this is this Mick's brother, Mick's kid? That's correct. That's Mick. That's Mick's son. And what is? And he's a skater. Y you think? Yeah. You see that that kid that just did the trick in the background on the screen? Uh huh. That's actually him, because after we shot all this stuff, you know, I wanted to shoot more skating stuff of him, but uh -huh. he just didn't have the time. So I so I, I I knew I was using this motif of the advertising spaces. So I asked him to send me as many great you know YouTube, uh, iPhone videos of himself, ah. and then I peppered them throughout the video to make it you know to include him more in the video because I only had that one day with him, like jumping the turnstiles and stuff. Now, now what what format did you shoot this on? Because this looks damn good, man. Thank you. Uh, I mean, just, 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 it just looks, it looks really, really um, vibrant and full. And this just looks really good. Uh, break, break down like the, what's the shot on? And, and you know, when I did the first video, Chaos Magic, I bought the camera because I knew I was going to shoot at night. And there's this Sony A7S camera. It's like a DSLR camera, very inexpensive, or not very inexpensive. It's inexpensive relative to the cameras I use on a daily basis on TV shows. Sure. It's like a very small, low profile, low profile. looks like a, a little camera. And you can use Canon lenses, which is like, I have a full range of cam Canon zooms. Um, so I don't have to deal with so many lenses when I'm on, when I'm out shooting by myself. Cause I shot all this stuff by myself. I mean, I had some days where I had assistance, but, um, I bought that. Uh, the well, well, excuse me, but you, you, I would think that were you were you put in the frame afterwards, or was somebody shooting this? On this day, I had my friend TJ, but okay. you know, you know, no, but you know, you got to take into consideration this is a lock off. The entire video, besides yeah. the drone shots and the shots where the cameras mounted on the bike, are all lock offs. That's just yeah. the way. That was the. It allows me to manipulate the frame because you know then I can cut into the frame and add that that video in the background and. And it just allows me to walk away and have other people operate. You know, I mean, yeah. my friend TJ, you know, was behind the camera, but literally it was a lock off like all the shots are. And, but anyway, and back to the camera, it was a Sony A7S on Chaos Magic, but it only shot 1080p. It was a, actually I had the cam I bought the camera almost five years ago with the with thinking that I would actually release music back then. But I got too busy. And then and who would have, who would have thought that 4k would have come along, right? <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And then I shot chaos magic and to a large extent, I'm really happy that I shot it in 1080 because it's very grainy. It's almost film like, and then when I finished shooting chaos magic, I sold the camera 
just because the because the a7s3 came out with the 4k and that's what i did this video on and i'll tell you you know i know they tell you to work in proxies when you edit but i edited the whole thing in 4k because i do i'm so heavily in visual effects and that visual effects look different with proxies than they do and um the, the the file of the video was almost three terabytes yeah so it was massive. So I, I yeah. shot this one on the A7S III with my same full range of zooms. And when you say when and you say two, edit in two two light you... panels, two, that's, and, you know, that's important. Two. You know, because yeah. one of the things when you look at when you're looking at these shots and you see like especially when you see the three of me in there, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have powerful lights with a lot of throw. I just had these two light panels that are just about this big and they operate with a with a light on the back. So what I would do is just I'd a battery, move, right? You just it's yeah. just a battery. I, what I did, I knew I, where I would be standing in, in, the, in when the shot was composited with the three of me. So if I was standing in the middle, I put a light in the frame here and a light in the frame here. No, oh, well, you have to show one of those shots where there's the three of me. Let, let, let's. Go. Right there. So in a shot like this, for example. Say I'm shooting the me in the in the center where I'm standing in the with the red hoodie. I would place the light there to do my edge on one side, and where I'm standing with the blue shirt, I would put a light there, or I put a light where I was back there, you know, a backlight. And then I, I don't have to worry about the light being in the frame because I'm going to mask out everything yeah. around me. And then when I shoot the next one, I put the the light where I was standing in the middle, and and, and so on. So I, I did. I spent the entire night just doing this one shot. And and where is this location? Is this, this is it under the Manhattan Bridge? That's correct. It's the, the LES Skateboard Park. That's right. Under the Manhattan Bridge, and because and I chose it for the primary reason of those two lights uh, that are right behind me. The, they're they're actually old sodium vapor lights, mm -hmm. like in Chaos Magic. But the re the entire rest of the park has been uh, retrofitted with LEDs. Yeah. Those are the only two left. But that was all I needed to color. The background and That's that great. color that I wanted, and you know, in the light panels, I used, you know, on on the left side, you can see I edged myself with white light, but I also edge, I edge filled myself on the other side with sodium vapor light. Now, when you're doing this and you're lighting yourself, do you have a reference? Do you have is, is can you? It, it, I guess you're, you're kind of winging it, right? Going, assuming I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. There's no, there's no. Um, uh, can you reference it as you go? Yeah, what I did, what, what I did this night was my wife Barblin came with me, and I would just have her stand in the spot. I'd put the yeah. guitar and on then light it. it. Yeah, light it, frame it up, and then we would sure. just change places. Okay, cool. Let's watch some more. I like that shot a lot. This one here. Hold on. I like that shot a lot. You know, it's funny that, that you know, I wanted to also only shoot when it rained. Yeah. For a number of reasons is it gives me privacy. And, yeah. <laughs> and also you get the wet down. Sure. The, and you don't have to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. The night before when we were shooting the, uh, the, the, the first three of me, Mm -hmm. um, I just laid the camera down on the floor and pointed it this way. And I asked my wife to run out and stand in the frame. And, and I was like, oh, this is great. So we went back the next night and shot this. And it's the same kind of thing where, you know, where I'm standing is where the lights were. And you yeah. can see how I'm lit. You know, I, I also wanted it to, be, to feel very natural like at night. But you got to understand that park is pitch black at night. The only yeah. lights are these, are these things, but they really don't have a lot of throw. So, you know, having these light panels edge me and uh, yeah, just really. And, really and the light look, and, and, and this, this, we'll call it a, a lamppost, looks friggin' great. Yeah. You know, the way it's exposed, it, 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 it looks friggin' great. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, I might as well tell you now, like, you know, that was another thing I would mask out. I would shoot this shot, right? And then I would dial it dial, dial down the exposure like quite a bit. So it was exposing just for that bulb. Yeah. And, and I would use that as a, uh, as a, as a plate, what do we call a plate shot. And then when I composited it, all the me's together, I also composited that light that was exposed at a much, you know, is, is that, is that 
that's what you did here? No, you know, when you here? it's only in that wide shot when you can actually see the bulb. It's like, yeah, right there. So I cut that bulb out. Because if I it was see. just exposed as, you know, as if I was just standing there, it would be just like, there would be no information in there at all. Makes sense. This, this effect, um, it's not really, an, I, I, I guess, would you call it an effect? The, uh, the close-up of the strings. Um, was this done on location? Or is this something that was done? It's a, it's a good question because in, when I did Chaos Magic, I did quite a bit of shots here in the apartment. Yeah. Like the, the license plate on the back of my bike. I just couldn't figure out a way to mount the camera so I could smoothly shoot it. So I, um, I shot the license plate green screen in my garden apartment downstairs. And I also shot all my, the, the shots of my feet on the pedals of the bike were shot downstairs. And then I went up to the, to the bridge on my skateboard with the camera and I basically uh, skateboarded down the bridge and shot plates that would be the background shots for the. And so I thought I might do that with the close ups of the on, on this one was just shoot them here. But the light is so specific down there that I thought, you know, what the hell? So uh, I went and rented a special lens for it. And then I went down to the skateboard park by myself and I, I spent the entire night shooting those close ups of the strings. How do you. How how do you play the strings and shoot at the same time? Was your, was, was your wife holding the bass and hitting the note, hitting the strings? No, that, you know, the thing about shooting so, so close up is that the focus is very specific. It's only in one place. You can't really pull focus with that kind of lens. Yeah. So I, I, I set the camera up on a tripod. I, and oh I, yeah. Okay. I just, and I just held the, yeah, I just, yeah, I got I, it. Yeah. I just held it up, you know, and I would basically yeah, yeah. rest my knuckles on the camera so it wouldn't move because you know it's so close it's so tight and then with the other hand i would just pluck the strings and i, I did that for like five hours let's find one hold on let's find one. There it is. There it is with the guitar. Yeah, you know, you know, it, it was so funny because you know a lot of people hang out in the park at night. Yeah. You know, you know, mostly scales, but you know, so a lot of kids go and skate and stuff, and, and and invariably they come up and ask me what they're doing, and they can clearly see that the camera's not even pointed at me. It's like, you know, an, what are you doing? An inch away from the <laughs> neck of the thing, and I was shooting. You know, my I shot my ring and did eyeball yep. shots and yep, yep. strings. I, I don't, I, you know, I, one of the things that people don't really see on a guitar, you know, people seem, I don't know what, it, I mean, I guess I know what it is, but people seem to be fascinated with my guitar. This one, the red one, I, you know, obviously, cause I play, you know, back there. Yep. Cause I've been playing it for so many years, but it, I mean, I've had the guitar since 1980 and there's all kinds of things on the pickups. Like I didn't really think about it until I pointed the, very close lens on there and there's years and years of blood on the pickups yeah and 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 also there's like all this like pixie dust all over it and i'm like what is all that colored dust and i realized it's pick pick dust from you know using a red pick one day a blue pick you know and 20 years ago i used the yellow pick or whatever and all that dust is all over the yeah there it is and uh and it, it's interesting to see the, the the pickups that close and see the rust and the sweat. Yeah, I noticed that. I noticed that. That's that's it's, cool. I really, I when I when I when I was cutting that into the video, I kept thinking to myself, ah, maybe I'm overextending myself, pe thinking people will think these abstract images have something to do with music, but I think they really do. They, they it's just like the details of life. If you were holding the guitar in your hand and and like looking at it really close, which you know you know what it really was. You know what inspired me to do that was Star Trek, the motion picture. Because, you know, the first, I don't know, half hour of the movie is the ship. You know, it was the first time Star Trek fans got to see the ship, you know, properly. You know, on the TV show, you saw it go by. It was always the same shot. But they really, really gave you a look at the Enterprise at the beginning of that movie. Like, 
here's the nacelles. Here's a close up. Here's a close up of the of the call numbers. Here's is that the movie that then it, it like when they let it, it left the dock? It left the dock and it was like. <laughs> and, and they also have like you know crew members in a shuttlecraft like yes. standing at the window like yeah yeah. I actually just recently I actually recently uh, watched that and uh, it was because I, I watched the whole series all three seasons and I was like let me watch you know, the first couple films. And, and it was interesting to see the jump from the last episode that was on TV to the film, you know, yeah. and it was quite a jump. Well, some, um, someday down the line, we'll probably have another conversation about that movie because I have a song that is inspired by some of the dialogue in that first film. All right. On. The conversation um, between Spock and Kirk when the, uh, when uh, the, Kirk is talking about taking the enterprise that's about to be decommissioned out on a final mission and how he wanted Spock to be the captain. And Spock, you know, says, you know, you operate from a false assumption. I have no ego to bruise. <laughs> right. I remember that. That. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. Yeah, yeah. One of the so, great I mean, I just, I just want to interject. I mean, people that, uh, I'm, uh, it's always an assumption that people that are, people that are watching, um, the show uh, know uh, a little bit of the history here. And this guitar, of course, is the guitar that Paris played uh, on, you know, Age of Coral and, and Best Wishes. And, you know, this, this is a, this is quite a legendary guitar. Yeah. And, and, you know, when, when you, when you, when you were telling that story, I remember seeing you play and, and uh, recollection of sort of like the Best Wishes era and how everything was soaking wet all the time. Like when you would play on stage, you guys, it, it, like in places like, like what was that place? Um, streets, you know, yeah. and places, you would just get, just, it's like someone just threw a bucket of water on you. You'd just be soaking wet. Those places had no air. You were soaking wet. The instruments got soaking wet. Well, it's amazing that, you know, this, you know, if you, you know, I, you know, I always say guitars are for life and, this guitar I've had, you know, most of my life. And if you take care of something, it will last forever. You know, this isn't part of the Steve Jobs world. This is, this was yeah. planned to be obsolete. This is one of those things that was made for life. Yeah. But as you were saying, it's amazing how, how uh, this thing, you know, persevered through all those years, but it wasn't until the revenge tour where, uh, you know, maybe we had two weeks left in the tour and I, you know, after a particularly wet, sweaty, crazy night, the next day I plugged in the guitar for sound check and it wouldn't make any noise. Oh no. Yeah, I, and, and, you know, I'm standing on stage and Harley's looking over at me and he's like, what's the matter? And I was like, it doesn't work. <laughs> we just, both, we literally both stood there looking at each other like, what are we gonna do? How can this be one of our staunchest allies? Right? Yeah. So that you know that night I ended up playing the playing the show on a um, like a three hundred dollar Fender Strat copy Ooh. that Rob Buckley had, and uh, you know, and, and you know, and I won't go into you know everything yeah. else, but uh, I ended up going home. I quit after that tour, and I put the guitar in a case, and it was in storage for nine years broken, you know, like unusable. And then I finally tracked down the, uh, you know, the guy who actually designed it and, uh, and I sent it to him and he had it for a year. Wow. And he didn't ultimately fix it. He just replaced all the electronics, which really sure. made me unhappy. So I contacted my, my guitar tech in New York, who I should have called first. And, uh, he actually put in all the old electronics that the guy from BC rich took out. And then once he reassembled it, he said to me, he goes, you know, there's nothing wrong with this guitar. He goes, it was just one of the pickups. Mm -hmm. So he just rewired one of the pickups. It was back, back to brand new. And I, and I used it on all the, uh, on, I used it on City Kids. There so it's, it's back in perfect, pristine condition. I know this isn't about the, uh, the no, hey, show, but, listen, uh, we, go, we, we go where the horse leads us. Let's watch, let's watch a little bit more. <laughs> Who's playing some lead? Who's playing some lead guitar there, huh? Come on now. 
Come on now. <laughs> it's really a melody. You know, it's funny. I, I talked to Chuck Lenahan from the Crumb Suckers about doing some solos on here, and it just wasn't the right timing. I actually got in contact with him about a week before mm -hmm. I released the video. And and also I spoke to the engineer that was I was working with on this, and he and he goes, and he we were we had already discussed how the the song kind of plays out. It's like there's a part where the guitar takes over and there's a guitar part where the bass takes over and there's a part where the keyboards take over. And there are all these little musical stories being told with the instruments like trade-offs. And, yeah. and he said that, I, he goes, I don't really see room for a guitar solo. It's, it, it, I think it would distract from this continuous feel of, of all the instruments trading off. And I agree I with that. Him. But I spoke to Chuck uh, yesterday and he's going to play on the next track. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, it's a melody. Hold on, it is melody, it's, yeah. It's not really a solo. But but it, it's kind of great. <laughs> Let me ask you about this stuff. Um, yeah, I definitely want to talk about that. Yeah, talk about how because th this this pops up a lot. Um, how is this done? And and uh, yeah, just to explain like the, the technical aspect of this. Well, this was something that um, my wife Barblin introduced me to. She one day she goes, "Do you know what an NFT is?" And I said, "No, never heard of it." And she said, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's kind of like cryptocurrency for art. It's a way of owning art and trading it online. And it only exists in this digital space. And of course, that just went over my head. And then um, she said that she knew that this uh, German guy, Paul, who who was involved in this company that created these NFTs, and that it's supposedly this thing in the future. And I personally wasn't so dragged into the concept of the nft because to me it still seems pretty abstract but i wanted some visual elements to the video to be different and uh so we spoke to paul we sent him to the artwork you can see the sean taggart uh agro's logo on the bottom of the skateboard yep. and paul took the artwork that we sent him he also took the artwork that was created by uh, my friend andrew sawyers in england who's like a comic book artist he did the one with the like kind of caricature drawing of me on the bottom and then we just did a you know, a, an Agro's logo on one on the uh, third skateboard. So Paul designed the skateboards and then his team made the NFTs and then he sent them to me. And I that's when I thought to myself, you know, how can I utilize these? And literally that morning, my friends Katya and Frank, who have this company called Scenester and they do uh, 3D mapping and projection advertising all over the world. Like if you want to advertise for like Gucci or DKNY. Yeah, that's what yeah, that's campaign. what my that's what my kids going to college for now. Uh, yeah, we exactly. talked about it. Yep. And so they they do these projections. And Frank called me that morning, or just texted me. And he said he goes, "Hey, I, I just bought a new projector, and I want to test it. Do you have any content you'd like me to project?" Yep. And I was out on Rockaway Beach jamming with Adam from the Toilet Boys because I was playing a Toilet Boys gig, learning the songs. And I didn't want to cut the rehearsal short, but I, you know, it was such an opportunity to see these things projected on the sides of buildings. So I raced home, grabbed my camera, met Frank, and he projected it on a couple of buildings. And I just ran around, you know, I, I probably shot all those projections in 25 minutes. Yeah, yes. I was wondering if those are those projected or was that done in post? But yeah, you know, I, I, I thought about that. And that's why I also shot them through fences and stuff. So people could see that they are clearly projected. Could like I didn't like this. I did in post, obviously. But, you know, this is, you know, after we did the projections and I saw the value of the NS, NFTs as a uh, as a uh, element for the video, I started to expound upon it. And I, that's when I asked John to come down into the subway with me and shot these sequences and then sequences that I'm in. So, and, so is this is this literally projected right then and there no on, on in the subway like this one this is something yeah. I composited in the edit yeah. okay I, I i figured that but yeah but all the projections we just shot like in that 25 minutes that that frank did the proje uh, projections on the sides of the bill Let, let's look for another one yeah. <laughs> Oh. 
Yeah. By the I way, you, I knew you wanted to stop with that one. By oh, the wait, way, can I just say wait, one wait, more thing? Wait, Love the chick dancing in the upper right. <laughs> yeah, I like to hide little things like that. That is awesome. I love her dancing. <laughs> just, just, just <laughs> dancing. It's awesome. You know, one, one last thing about the NFTs I, I have to add is uh, that, um, you know, the other thing about NFTs is they're auctioned off and sold once. Yeah. And people can trade them. That's how they become like cryptocurrency. And then they earn a, a, an amount of money, you know, like royalties for each one that's sold. But the initial auction uh, of the, these three NFTs, the, the sale, the, the proceeds from those three uh, NFT sales will go to the Tony Hawk Foundation to build skateboard parks in like, you know, underprivileged neighborhoods and stuff like that. I think, didn't, didn't one of those just go for like a million dollars, some, some like record breaking sale? Yeah, you know, I don't know what the criteria for the high prices are because, you know, yeah. it's such a new thing that people are drawing stick figures and uploading them and no one's buying them. You know, you have to have something that's artistically relevant and hopefully somebody who's interested in either Sean Taggart or or Andrew yeah. Sawyer's work or the agros or or this song or this video or, you know, I don't know what people's uh, interest in collectability is. If they're sure it, it, it has to do with the individual with the money. It's like they always say, if you have something and somebody pays a million dollars, it's worth a million dollars. Look that at is. Starbucks, you know. Yeah. Like, I love that whole, you know, like they used to have this thing on the subway. It was like a napkin that said, you know, cup of coffee, 50 cents. And then somebody crossed it out and wrote four dollars. And that was a Starbucks ad. You know, they you just charge four dollars for it and all of a sudden it's worth more. But that's, yeah. that's, that's uh, so I'm really hoping, you know, it, it, it gets something. And it was funny the other day I was, I was, I was going to go down to the skateboard park to shoot and I was just too exhausted from shooting the night before. And then at like 9 PM, I looked at Instagram and saw Tony Hawks was at the park all day skating. And I missed the opportunity to get a shot of him for the video. But, you know, as my wife said, the video is not about Tony Hawk. Tony Hawk's still doing it out in public skate parks. He is unbelievable. The, the, the is few amazing. videos that they showed of him at the LES park were like, I mean, I shot a bunch of people riding that one great. Like there's one shot of this kid. He just yep. goes up and does a fakie. And, you know, every I, I set up the camera there. I must have had it just pointed at that spot for an hour waiting for kids to do tricks and stuff. And they all did cool stuff. And then Tony Hawk posts this one picture. He's been in this park for two minutes and he just goes up and he does this like, Rit. And comes back down. It's just, you know, I mean, he is the greatest in the world. So I don't go. know why it surprises me, but it was just so awesome. But I would have right. liked to uh, talk to him about it because, you know, his involvement could play a role in, you know, he actually purchased two NFTs from this company, you know, that my friend Paul in Germany does. And that was the, that was the impetus to get us to donate the money to the Tony Hawk Foundation was knowing that he had interest in this nft company already and already purchased a couple and just you know i thought if if he was played more of a role maybe the auction would uh go uh get a higher bid but yeah. we'll see whatever it does it's going to go to the tony hawk foundation and, uh, cool all and right let's move on These here? Yeah, those those I composited. Those aren't projections. Okay. You know, it's funny because that, that's a, that's by the 34th Street, 33rd Street train station, which mm -hmm. I've come up out of that station so many times in my life. And and the thing that's extraordinary about the staircase that leads up from the station is it's like a little frame of the Empire State Building. As you and come up the, as you come up the stairs. Yeah, and I've yeah, yeah. a hundred times in my life, you know, it's just one of those things that I put in my back pocket. You know my uh, my creative back pocket. Like if I ever need to get a shot of the Empire State Building, I'm going to do it from the bottom of these stairs. I'm going to point up so you can see the stairs and all this stuff in the foreground. It it frames it perfectly. So I get I get in my car, I drive up there, I park my car, and I look, and there is scaffolding surrounding the the subway station, so you couldn't see the Empire State Building. From oh, that this is unfucking believable. So I uh, I set up the camera. And I looked down at the camera and I'm like, what am I looking at? Like, I couldn't figure out where the Empire State Building was. And I looked up and they had just turned out the lights. Mm. You know, the light on the top of the Empire State Building. Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh my fucking God. So I go home 
And uh, I go back the next night and I shoot this shot with the light on. I went a little bit early because it apparently goes off at seemingly random times every night. And also in the video, there's a shot of the New Yorker Hotel logo. Yes. I did the same thing. I went out, I set up the camera and I have this like long lens and I'm like kind of searching for the, I'm like, where the hell is it? Why, why can't I find it? And I look up and, and they turned it off. Ah. So I had to go back the next night and do it. You know, you know little- sometimes guys like you and me with our, with our, um, long New York Manhattan memories, you know, it's like, let me go, you know, things that, things that have been there and, and are, are seared into our memory banks, you know, um, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not anymore, you know, like. Leave this things- shot up for a second. I just, I just want to point out something like just little things that I spend time doing, you know, when you're creating a frame and make, trying to make it as beautiful as possible. When you're looking at. Is that, something- wait, is that my girl dancing in the window? It is. And, and and she's also dancing on the top of the building to the right of the Empire State Building. Hold on. Oh, wait, I just saw her. Hold on. Hold your horses. Hold on. Ah! <laughs> she's way back there. You know, I, I, I see there. her. I see her. But not just see, that. But if you're looking at the smart. building. This was smart because this subliminally appears to animals like me. There's like, <laughs> there's like, there's like that movement. Like, like I, I don't see it, but it, but somehow it's, 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 it's speaking it, it, to me. It erupts it's drawing your loins. me in. It makes your loins move. But, if, <laughs> if you, but the thing is, I, I shot this shot at like around one in the morning. So you know, there was really nobody in this building on the left. Yeah. So I basically took one row of windows. And then copied them and put them all over the place. Like those blue windows on the left, there was only a couple of those windows. So I just cut and pasted and copied them and distorted them and bent them so they all fit perspective wise. But almost all those windows on the side of that building were composited. Makes sense. Love the lightning effect. Obviously, the lightning is composited. That's cool though. That's working. When when you when you composite something like that, when you when and and how long does it take soup to nuts to sort of get it in there, lay it in there, render it so you could take a look at it? Like this, this looks to me like this takes a little time, correct? It does. So what I would do is I would chop the frame in, in, in sections. So, um, so I, I basically cut the frame. So the, me with the Les Paul and the blue shirt is if you were just looking at the, the, the frame, most of the frame would be empty and there would just be a, a sliver of the part where I'm standing. And then I would yeah. create one where uh, I'm wearing the red hoodie, but only between the pillar to the end of the frame. I see. And then I would do a sliver, you know, where, and then I would cut out mats uh, between the arches where the uh, lightning appears. And so, so the lightning actually is appearing, even though it's the same shot of the lightning, it appears three different times. So there's three different shots of lightning, which has to be composited over every mask that has an opening. And then you have to like, you know, the mask isn't just like a simple box. I have to cut around all those buildings and stuff and around my head. And this then sounds you- to me like a, this sounds to me like a, like this is a couple. This is definitely a couple. This is like three or four or five hours work. Right. Well, the most complicated part was like, you know, my head is sticking up on the left on my red hoodie. Yes. Above the building. So as my head is moving around. I have to create the mask around my head, click over one frame, yeah, mask around my head. Redo it again, yeah. Let's so, look at it re- let's look at it in real time. Bro, it looks great. Thanks. It looks really good. Hours and hours and hours. Yeah, no, but it, it, it looks really good. Um <laughs> There it is again. That's my subway stop. Uh, <laughs> is that the J line? <laughs> it is the J line. <laughs> so, like, say, say, take a shot like this, for example. The compositing is there are there are four there are four elements five elements composited into this. All the three NFTs and the advertisements, and then the top of the frame where the sky is. I did a mat a mask that cuts out the sky. 
that because I didn't want to affect the lighting of the the subway platform. I wanted it to remain sodium vapor, which is another great color, you know, that goes with the rest of the video. And I was able to that way. I'm able to color correct the the subway platform with with the sodium vapor. And then I went up into the sky, and I crushed it so you could really see the clouds. And then I made the sky blue. And then I added the lightning. Let's look at it again in real time, just real quick. Sorry, I lost it there, but I like this shot a lot too. Yeah, you know that was just one day when I was when I was riding to uh, to to shoot those subway shots with me skateboarding by the NFTs. I had the camera just sitting on a tripod, and uh, I didn't so much want it to be a shot of me um, holding the skateboard. I wanted the skateboard to kind of have a life of itself. That's why I have just the shots of the skateboard with the with the light up wheels, and I thought this would go with that, like. You know, initially, I, which I didn't really expound on the idea, but I wanted to have this feeling of like the, the beginning of the Warriors, where people from all over the city are moving towards the skateboard park or the meeting and like in the Warriors. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing that with John and with me and with the bicycle. But I never really I didn't have enough time to enlist people yeah. to do that kind of thing. It would have been a whole different video, but I still got the kind of feel. Of, of people going somewhere for sure and to me was a uh, part of that for, for sure and like you said initially in the beginning I, I there there is continuity here between this and the first one you know you you, you feel like it, it's it's not oh now for something completely different you know it, it definitely uh has that same uh <laughs> It, it, it's it's funny that was those three close-ups of the guitar that we just passed yep the, the th those three in particular i chose for for different reasons but the, on the first one it's probably i don't even know if anybody would even see it but the the guitar is like rotating like this and that sodium vapor light that uh we see in all those shots in the background was reflected in the pickup Mm. And, and it just kind of goes by in a gleam and it, it looks really beautiful if you if you see it and then the last one is just kind of the nut on the pickup and in the nut you can see the reflection of the string wobbling and it you know again it's, it had happened so fast but uh i got i definitely got a little thrill watching it after i first cut it in <laughs> Anytime there's flames and explosions and like hard, fast music, it's a win. Yeah. Well, you know, the, that explosion is just kind of like a homage to Age of Coral cover. Yeah. But, it uh, is. you know, I, I know you, you probably don't remember, but I used to spend so many hours, uh, you know, sifting with a fine tooth comb through all the footage for the music videos we, we made together. I do remember. To find, <laughs> to I do. Find yeah, that I remember. Movie. <laughs> and you can imagine even with these close-ups i just sat there like with a magnifying glass i was like oh my god i can see a reflection of the street mitch, mitch, mitch brody the video can i see it with one frame one more frame can i see it with one less frame can i see it with one more frame again can i see it with one <laughs> i'd be like yo i'm going out for a while i'll be back in a couple of hours man and we'll stand in the back of the room with one one hand over one eye okay play it again <laughs> <laughs> Can I see with two frames? I'd be like, hey, what do you guys want for lunch? <laughs> you know, I can tell you that I thought of you uh, at, at about 1230 in the afternoon yesterday when I was finally outputting the master of this video because I've been in that position where something was finished or when I wasn't sure something was finished or I knew it had to be finished because we had a deadline. Yeah. And, and always this feeling of you standing over my shoulder and – and I was sitting in my at my computer pressing, okay, make the master. And all I kept thinking of was you standing behind me. 
<laughs> well, thank you. I'll take oh, that. It's just a music video. It's a fucking music video for Christ. It's only a music video. It's like when I drive, you know, it's I, I never, never do I never look at my rear view mirror without thinking of my friend Al Romano, who like helped me uh, learn how to drive. He'd always just say, he'd always go, trust your mirrors, Pete. Don't, because I would always look over my shoulder. <laughs> and I was, you know, he goes, don't look over your shoulder. Trust your mirrors. Trust your mirrors, Pete. And I swear to this day, whenever I'm looked in my rear view mirror, I hear Albie say, Trust your mirrors, Pete. I, I, I still use that term, you know, every now and then. Whenever there's like whenever there's some some drama or or, or you know, some seemingly end of the world hysterics, I I'll always say, you know, to whoever or or, or, or to myself out loud, it's only a music video. And in other words, the sun's gonna go down, the sun's gonna come back up tomorrow, the birds are gonna chirp. It's only a music video. <laughs> Well, you know what? The deadlines are powerfully important. I think, I mean, yeah. I, definitely, I learned that when we yes. were making those videos. Yeah. Because, you know, if, if you know, if Michelangelo hadn't been paid, you know, like commissioned to paint the Sistine Chapel and told that he had to finish it at a certain time, he'd be painting it forever. That's just sure. the nature of how we are. And I learned that during that few years when we were making those videos and that, you know, when it was over, you just like let it go. But the problem with, uh, with making one for yourself and not, I ha actually had to impose a deadline on myself. I actually mm. told Barbara, my wife, who basically handles everything for me business-wise, she, I said, we have to contact Metal Maria and get a premiere and get a deadline or I'll never finish this thing. I mean, the same thing happened with Chaos Magic. I must have been working on that video for eight months. And it, it just, But, yeah. but I, th I think that this was well-timed and, and good form to get the second one out, you know, relatively soon after Chaos Magic. You, you know, I, I feel like that that kind of, you know, is out there. And here, you know, here's another one. I think if this would have taken a couple more months, you know, I think you might have might have lost a little bit of the, the 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 power of inertia, you know? Right. Well the third one will I I, I had planned to shoot it yesterday. Oh. In one day, I was going to actually go for a one day shoot, but uh, that didn't work out. But the song is almost completed. I'm going to have Chuck Lenahan from the Crumb Suckers do a solo on it. And then uh, I'll come up with the only problem is I'm starting a TV show on November 5th, 15th for uh, for five months. So that'll oh. that'll slow me down in, in New York, in New York. Yeah. In Brooklyn. Well, that's good. Yeah. But I mean, it's do, still do, do you travel anymore to, to shoot or you just take gigs in New York? Um, well, the last two jobs I did, one was in Hawaii and one was in Atlanta. And so I was out of my home for basically six months, seven months of the year. Wow. Here. And I just, me and my wife decided together, even though she came with me and we had a great time that we didn't want to travel anymore for shows. So when, when do you, when do you start this show? Um, I think it's November 15th. Okay. It's called evil. So and is, is that the, the, like, does that work like regular hours, Monday to Friday, <laughs> 6 a.m. to? No, uh, it, it, it will be Monday will probably be 6 a.m. And then, you you know, you do 13, 14 hours. So yeah. the call time on Tuesday will be. Right, right, minutes. right. Whatever's relative to. Right. But but you don't work on the Friday, weekday. your call time could be 3 p.m. Sure. But, but you, you don't work on Sundays, do you? No, but okay. you can. Like I, like I day play on Law and Order, uh, organized crime, and they call me often to work on Saturday and Sunday because I do what's called tandems or, or scenes that didn't get completed in the week, and they they just schedule sure. for the weekend. They got to circle back to finish it. Yeah, so I'll go in and do those. All right, because I want to invite you to something uh, in November, but we'll talk about that later. Let's It'll have uh, to be on the weekend. It's on a Sunday, bro. Yeah. You <laughs> I'm enjoying this because like, I've been so immersed in it. I, I love to be able to have people understand how much work went into it. And it's funny to even think of it as work because, you know, I have a choice. I could, you know, sit and watch TV or I can indulge in myself in something, you know, more compulsive, but um, personally satisfying. And, and I, I find it really no different than the songwriting process. And, and to a large extent, I, I incorporate them because when I started making this um, group of, of, of musical movements. I don't even, City Kids isn't really a song. It's a, 
it's a piece of music that incorporates three pieces of music. And, uh, you know, I call the first half City Kids. The second half is called Ghosts of New York. And the last, uh, the, the ending is called The Haunting. And I, I literally assembled it in Final Cut Pro because I had one part of the song in Final Cut Pro. And I was editing. Who's stuff. cutting on Final Cut Pro these days? I am. Wow. You're looking at a fucking masterwork of music video making and I did it in Final Cut Pro. So wow. there's no way to criticize it. It is, a- is, is, is is that the last version of Final Cut Pro that you is that like Final was that Final Cut Pro X? Is that is that, oh, yeah, is that Final Cut Pro 10? Yeah, I never yeah, I, I never got that far. I I I bailed out before that, but yeah. But 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 by the way, of course, of course I I cut on on Adobe Premiere with my final cut keyboard, right? <laughs> my final cut cheater keyboard which I, has I, all i took a premiere course but i'm just so good at final cut pro 10 there's just no point in doing the other thing but anyway I like i was saying is ahead. so i had the song i had pieces of the song laid out in final cut pro and i was trying out images like the skateboarding scene and we're talking about like you know basic tracks just so i can get a feel of it so i lay that skateboard shot in it and just seeing the visuals helps me decide how the music will develop and i was um taking piano lessons from uh, my friend Dirk, Dirk, and a German piano teacher that my Barbling found for me, because I uh, I had this rose it's back in the corner there, if you can see it, mm-hmm. I got it from my dad, and I had I've had it in storage for, you know, almost a decade and a half, because I never really had a place to set it up, and when we moved in here, I said to Barbling, I was like, do you mind if I set up the rose in the living room? She goes, no, of course, it's like a work of art. So we, I set up Rhodes up in the, in the living room, and then one day she just texted me, you have a piano lesson at 3 o'clock. Uh, you can't have a piano in, in the living room if you don't know how to play it. That's right. So Good for her. I started taking piano lessons on that from this guy, Dirk, and uh, I, I, I started losing interest very quickly playing Beatles songs and stuff like that. I just never had any interest. So I said to Dirk, Yesterday. I said, uh, you know, when I learned how to play guitar, even now, I, I couldn't pick up a I couldn't pick up this guitar and play you a song by somebody that uh, you know of a song that I didn't write. Right. He said I immersed myself in the guitar by just writing songs, and I'm not really enjoying playing Beatles songs, but I I would be interested in approaching the piano the same way I approach the guitar, just working on my music on the piano. And he said, Yeah, certainly we can do that. And so our piano lessons turned into more like jam sessions as opposed to piano lessons. And he would he would basically explain to me what I did musically on the guitar, on the piano, and explain to me how, you know, uh, you know, I, how I was using all these traditional songwriting techniques. But he would end, you know, I would just pick up the guitar and I would play him something like part of the song that goes. And he would break down those four chords on the piano and play them back to me. And then explain to me what I had done, even even on something that simple. And as soon as I heard the part on the piano, he's, he's like transcribing it in a way. Yeah, it's exactly what he was doing. We we first did it with a bunch of acoustic songs that I had, but I started doing. I wanted to do it with the heavier parts too, to just because I kept telling him, I was like, I feel like there's so much in those chords that rings out, that that opens up um, your mind to the idea of. Melodic, melodic possibilities. I mean, that's the, the best thing about making something simple is something that implies something. And he said, oh yeah, you're definitely implying these notes. And then he played the notes and I was like, okay. And so I would record him, you know, just with uh, my iPhone playing that part. And then I would take the iPhone video and drop it into Final Cut Pro over the part in the song to hear how the keyboards would sound on the song. And I started peppering in these little iPhone videos of him playing on top of this song. Right. And then and then at some point I was like, wow, I might have to release the video with all these little snippets of him playing from the iPhone video. <laughs> you know, cuz it sounded good. You know, yeah. but well, I, I, well we're going to we're going to get to that in the song. I he does but I might have had, but I might have had demo love, so I I, I I I said to him I was like, listen, let's go into the studio and I have a quite nice keyboard upstairs at Nord. So we took the keyboard and my friend Vinny uh, the engineer that mixed this, we, and we spent the the entire day recording piano. And then when we came to the end, because initially what I wanted was I wanted Dirk to play um, this one motif in the song that I actually wrote on the roads. 
the one that goes down and now the like kind of spooky part at the end and i was, I was well, well, don't get ahead of yourself let's let's get to it and, and talk okay. about it Let, let's, right. let's, 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 i'm sorry. i mean because it's one of my favorite really what my one of my favorite parts of, of the song I, I i love it so hold on <laughs> You know who freaked out and called me when he saw this? Who? Zum. Oh wow, that's great. He loved it. He freaking he was over the moon. He was he loved it. Thanks. He, I, he, the bass he, sound. He, yeah. I wouldn't have the bass sound without Zum. That's all sans amp. Yeah, he he like right. He called me. Yo, did you see that? I'm like, yeah, I just watched it. I sent it to him, and he I said, yo, you see Paris's new thing? He said no. Then he called me. He said he he was over the moon, over the moon. He loved it, man. Love this shot, bro. Just you know, love it, this shot. Just love this shot. Tell me about this shot. I shot. We we I did the drone stuff. It's almost exactly like what happened with Chaos Magic. Was I had the I had the lock of the video of Chaos Magic, and I had for months been trying to enlist a drone operator. And the night before the premiere on Metal Injection for Chaos Magic, I get a call from my friend Danny, who's a film professional I know. And he said, hey, man, did you ever get those drone shots you wanted? And I said, no, I have it. And the video premieres tomorrow. So if we're going to do it, we have to do it tonight. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean tonight? I said, well, we, I, you'd meet me at, say, 1230 on the Williamsburg Bridge. And it was 1230 a.m.? Right yeah, in the middle of the night, yeah. Because that entire video was shot between midnight and 5 a.m. Right. And I said, and the problem is we can only shoot when the subway, when a train is going by. And the trains come by, go by every 30 minutes. So oh. if we go up there, we'll probably, and, and, I, and we got up there. I, I had actually gone up there one more, one time earlier with the drone operator, but he couldn't get the drone to fly because apparently bridges are, uh, have magnets all throughout them. It's part of what holds a suspension bridge together or something. And he couldn't get the drone to fly. And when Danny called me, I didn't want to tell him that because I just hoped it would fly. And we got up there and he couldn't get the drone to fly either. Well, so I said, how about, you know, you know, one of the things we do on set is we're solving problems all the time. There are things constantly not working. You got to you got to forget what you think, you know, and, and figure something else out. So I said to Danny, I was like, you're telling me it won't fly because it's because of the bridge. He goes, yeah. I said, so let's walk off the bridge, which is no small feat. It's like a half a mile. Yeah. So let's walk off the bridge. Let's take the drone off the ground on the sidewalk and then just walk back up the bridge and fly the drone up. And that's oh, wow. what we did. And we had to do that over and over. Wow, on that's that. labor intensive, man. So so this was almost exactly the same thing. I had been trying to enlist, enlist drone operators for about a month, and I just wasn't having any luck. And this guy had, had a job cancel, and he called me up literally the day before, and I said, okay, let's shoot drone tomorrow. And we went to the LES skateboard park and shot for, I'd say, an hour and a half. I stopped editing to meet him. To shoot the drone footage. Can you just do that? Can you just show up and, and, and fly a drone around these days? No. But, I mean, it, it's a federal fence to fly a drone on the Williamsburg Bridge. Yeah. But anyway, so, you know, we the funny thing was there was about 10 cops down there by the LES skateboard park, which is odd. There, it was, I think it was they were following around this group of kids on bikes. The last time I saw those kids show up, there were all these cops there. They just basically, wherever the kids go on the bikes, the cops followed them on scooters. So they were there, but they, they didn't seem to have any concern with us. Good but tactic. I, I had a list of, you know, I said, my, my drone guy was like, I can fly, I can do this. I was like, listen, I have a mission. 
I said, I need to reveal the part because all the skateboarding I did was really close and microcosmic y. You know, you didn't really get a sense of the scope of the part. I said, I need you to fly through the arch and show me the part. And then yeah. I need you, and I need you to fly out as far out as you can, pointing down at the bridge and come down. And then after that, once we've gotten those two establishing shots, then I want you to go around and shoot skaters and stuff like that. And that's what we did. We shot for about an hour and a half. We actually shot until he ran out of batteries. Let's look. Let's look at. Let's let me back this up and let's look at a couple. The drone shots are just spectacular. <laughs> And I love how you saw you hold off on the drone stuff until there's like this mood change in the song, you know? Yeah, I definitely wanted you to feel like yeah, the different movements. Again, you know, when this sure. I'm going to put this, you know, this will probably be the side of an EP. This 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 little group of, of music um, that I'm going to put out this year. It will probably be Chaos Magic and another song on one side and this song on the other. Makes sense. Let's keep going. <laughs> How did you do all this profile stuff with these young people? Uh, well, this is this girl's name is Ayana, and she was just sitting there looking fabulous. <laughs> and I walked up to her and I was like, "Excuse me." She's like, "Yes." I said, "Are you going to let those freckles go to waste, or are you going to let me take a picture?" <laughs> and she said, "And she, you know, she was like, of course." And she goes, "What's it for?" And I, I showed her, you know. As I was editing the video, I'd upload it to um, YouTube privately so I could, you know, watch it all the time and know what I needed. So I showed it to her really quick and she she was like, oh, that's great. I'd love to be in that. So uh, she just sat there and uh, I got out my bounce board and framed up a couple of shots with her. And yeah. as soon as you start shooting one of them, other people yeah. are like, hey, what are you guys doing? Right. And then, you know, oh, and you know what we did? Well, actually, when we first went to the park, I would just go there and sit there. And the next thing you know, you end up chatting with people and everybody is very friendly. Um, yeah. You know, it's not like when we were teenagers and, and you always got, what the fuck are you looking at? <laughs> you know, it's people are much more friendly these days. Yeah. But, in, in, in a certain sure. regard, in a, in a certain regard, for sure. And also that's a hot spot of activity, that park, like people, people congregate there. And it, it's not a battle zone, at least in my experience. I, I worked on something down there fairly recently with uh with DMC uh, uh, for uh, some uh, re-release of the glasses and uh, spent a day down there. And it seems like it's, it's not like a hot contested battle zone, you know, people hang out. You know? And that one, there's this one kid in there who I have another close up of. I, I really wanted to, you know, it was another thing. It's like you go out there with a mission and sometimes it, it happens, sometimes it doesn't. My plan yeah. was to shoot somebody skateboarding and doing a lot of really cool tricks and then do a portrait like this. Sure. So it would be like, Tricks and then a portrait of that person, tricks and then a portrait of that person. It just didn't end up happening that way, except for with Ayana and with this kid, Aaron. Well, Aaron, the other kid smoking a cigarette? No, Aaron, no, that he he wasn't even a skater. He was just hanging out. Yeah. I just loved the way he looked and he looked like a punk rocker. So I threw him in. But this other kid, there's a close up of him, but he, there's two really elaborate shots where somebody does like a rail slide and I have many cuts. Mm -hmm. And then I have a portrait of him. I was really happy with that and I would have liked to have had that more. But, you know, once the video is completed, you realize there's only so much room to put stuff in there. So a lot of times, you know, I, I, I always use this analogy that, you know, especially for an artist of any kind. Or this is something I learned when I was in art school. I went to the High School of Art and Design and School of Visual Arts. And one of the things that I realized early on is. Is that it's not always the intent of the artist 
um, uh, that, that, that delivers the result. You know, I, I discovered early on that you could sit down to draw a horse and you sit there and you start, you take your pencil or paper, you start drawing the horse and a half an hour later, you have a really amazing drawing of a duck yeah. and you show it to people and they're like, wow, man, you really know how to draw a duck. And then I say, <laughs> yeah, but I was trying to draw a horse. Makes sense. And that, that, you know, I, I, you know, I just, I realized, I recognized that early on when I was doing that kind of art. And it's the kind of thing that you have to do when you're working on film too, because film it, on this level is an art too, because you're really, really finding it in while you're doing it. You may have a lot of preconceived mo notions. You might think, you, may, you know, when I started City Kids, I was going to do a video about a horse, but I did a video about a really awesome duck. Okay. Duck on. Let's get her up to speed. Hold on. Get rid of all the banners. Let's watch some more. Love the drone shots, man. Enter piano. Yes. Yes. Okay. I love it. I assume those are the kids that the cops were following around? Yeah, the very next shot is the cops following them, actually. <laughs> nice, nice shot, man. Now, here, here's, a, here's another one of those shots that people don't probably don't realize what they're perceiving. But the entire left hot side of the frame was sky. But it was washed out, burned out sky. It didn't look nice. Mm -hmm. So I took another shot of the bridge and just composited it in there yeah. to cover up yeah. the sky. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'm sorry. Same thing there. You know, John's in the air, and I had to do a traveling mat. There you to go. To cover up the sky there, but it actually. There it is. It it, it kind of like does this, which is really cool. You know, it. It also fills the frame out nicely, you know, as opposed to like you said, the sky, like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like the aggro's flags, bro. You know, the, the one on the left is the Sean Taggart logo that he made for me, yeah. which I love. So I had to make a flag out of that one. And uh, yeah. and then the other one, I figured I just did that also. Um, I love that logo that Sean made. It's awesome, extraordinary, it's great. It's great artist. Especially the O, the guy with the oh, It's great. I mean, obviously, I put those flags in and I put them, I had to put the moon behind the flags. And yeah. I, you know, I put the Agro's logo also on. I mean, it's a busy shot here, man. There's a lot going on right here. Yeah. You know, in this shot. <laughs>
Is that the yeah. R and the B? Is that the R and the BC rich? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny those close-ups, like my, the close-ups of my face. I sh didn't shoot at the at the uh, skateboard park. I shot them at the base of the Williamsburg Bridge, huh. because uh, you know when when you're shooting alone, you have to kind of like incorporate whatever you can to help you. And all the cars coming down the bridge uh, provide this amazing backlight and stippling. Uh, so I stood there and I used that as a backlight and I brought my light panels and, uh, and to get like, you know, the, the pings in the eyes and stuff. But I shot that at the base of the Williamsburg bridge. And um, then I went to the lower East side skateboard park to shoot some more. And I was so exhausted. It must've been five o'clock in the morning that I packed up my stuff and I left. And it wasn't until two days later that I realized I left my life light panels. Ah, park. The road That's, will kill you. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's like the road will kill you, man. Yeah, I know, man. Somebody they, they, they served me well. I know it just oh, it stings, man. It's it's it's, it's that's the life we chose, you know. Ah, oh, fuck! I left the tripod, you know, like sitting on the corner. Ah, like when we did the biohazard video, we left the box of lenses on Bedford Avenue. Did we? Yeah, and the next day we realized, oh my God, the lenses are gone. So me and you got in your car and we drove to Bedford Avenue. And the bakery had it. No, we were, we we parked and we were just kind of standing on the sidewalk. And this old lady said, "That's right." This kid said something like, "Oh, were you guys shooting that video? Th th this old lady over here has something of yours, I think." So we went over to her apartment, knocked on the door, and she let us in. And there was the box of lenses. Like, oh my God! Thank you for that memory, man. Yeah. Wow, I I remember that now. A box of lenses. Box. Oh, just a box a box of Zeiss lenses. That's right. It's a lot of money. <laughs> Quarter of a million dollars of lenses, right? Oh my God. I think you gave her a hundred dollars or something. That is so nuts. All right, here we go. <laughs> I love this like spooky transition here. This sort of like twisting in the wind transition. When me and uh, when I was first talking to Derek about how to doing the outro, uh -huh. um, I had already laid in that sound in Final Cut Pro. Again, that's, that's why I was stressing that whole thing about how I, I build most of my songs in that editing program for some what, reason. Hold on. What is what is that it's sort of pulsing and a submarine sound? Yeah. So I had that, and that's the way the song was going to end. Uh huh. You know, I was just figuring out because I always like to put credits and stuff, and I like to have this feeling of like completion at the end. Sure. And, and I and Dirk, Dirk was over, and I said to him, "You know, we haven't really discussed the outro I'd like to do." And I sat down and I played him, you know, the rudimentary, but down, 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 down. Mm -hmm down 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 and i said i'd like you to start with this you know the way i wrote it and then just go off in some direction for like 30 seconds and that'll be it and so uh he he did that he played it the way i asked him to and then two or three times after he played it he was like listen he was like what is that sound is that is that a submarine <laughs> and, and he and he goes play it back and he re reaches down to the keys and like without, without even like listening too much, he just hit this one key and he was playing the note that the submarine was playing. Ping, 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 ping. Yeah. Then he played a chord and then he took it from there. And I was like, wow, that's way better than starting with the melody that I wrote. I sure. just start it that way and then see where it takes you. And then he, we, we did it a little bit, but he's not much on... Um, Memorization. He's like a jazz pianist. He and he actually doesn't even consider himself a pianist. He's a vibraphone player. He is thinks right? the piano is like but, a secondary. But, nevertheless, a very accomplished musician. Correct. Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So we went into the studio, and uh, 
we recorded all the keyboard parts on the song. It, it, it was it was taking like ten hours, you know, trying you know trying to get the sound and mesh. It, it was a whole thing. But we finally got to the ending, and I said, okay, let's do the outro. And uh, you know, he did one that was like fifteen seconds long, and then he did one that was like twenty seconds long, and, and, I, and I said. I said, you know, it's great. It just doesn't feel like it. And then I said, how about incorporating one of the piano melodies from, from the song also that you play over this? And he goes, oh, I can do that. And then he just improv this. And and then I asked him to do it one more time. Actually, I asked him to do it more t like 10 more times. <laughs> of course you did. Okay. And I dropped all the versions that he did into Final Cut. And then I started cutting it. What on top of you, like just on the timeline, one like just layered yeah. them, and then I edited it into I, I probably not that many edits. I'd say six edits to make it as long as it is, and and then I sent him an MP3 of it, and he goes, I don't remember playing it that way. <laughs> Did you edit it? And I said, Yes. He goes, He goes, You're you're an excellent editor. I said, How do you feel about it? Are you okay with it? And he said, Sure. And Let's so that's. That that end that's that's what that's what's on the record. Let's hear it. Feeling a little jazz vibe in there. It's you know every time I hear it, I love it. I, I love everything. Yeah. Feeling way. feeling like a little little jazz in there. It's really nice. I like it. it. It's like it's like a ghostly echo of of in a way of what we just watched. You know what I mean? It, it's sort of like a like I love it. it, it it's it's a refrain. It's an echo. It, it's 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 slightly haunting. Uh, it's really great. I, I love it, man. I, I really love that part of the song a lot. As I said to Derek, I said when we when we started expounding on the piano parts, I said this is like a different part of the movie. Yeah. Look, he goes, that's exactly right. You can take a motif and just play it in you know minor, major, change keys, and it just feels like a different part of the movie. And exactly. one of the things that I did by creating this deadline is I kind of screwed myself out of having here in the video. I'd already spoken to him about trying to figure out a way to shoot him and and have him be in the video. But the timing just yeah. didn't work out. But uh I'm hoping to incorporate him in in other songs probably not in the next couple because they're more straight up rockers but i have uh i'd say four or five zeppelin-esque acoustic songs that uh i've been playing with him and uh when the piano is incorporated into those songs it's even 10 times more zeppelin -y. it's like a little john paul jonesy and when we do that if we do that uh then derek will be presented more as a uh Musician. What are the plan? What are the plans um, for for this music, or is, or is it is there a game plan at all? Or what, what are you what are you what are you hoping? What are your hopes? What are you what are you looking to do here? Uh, what would you like to see happen uh, with the latest uh, City Kids video and track? You know, I I feel like I'm just trying to teach 
people how to perceive what I'm doing, you know, in, in my way, you know, people are trained to have expectations of, you know, people always saying to me, when's the album coming out? Well, the album's never coming out. That's never, right. I'm never putting out an album. That that's that's uh, something I will. Ne I'm, I have no interest in doing that. Yeah. There's too much time. I mean, I I mean, I used to. I think I used to mention this to you when we were making music videos together. One of the things I loved about making music videos was I had the sense of completion. A couple of times a month, every time yeah. we would wrap a video and hand it off, I had this explosive sense of accomplishment and joy. And when when I was in a band where you put out an album every two years, you only had that sense of completion every two years. It was horrible. As a as an artist, you it was it was like you were starving yourself for a sense of accomplishment. And but when we had that, you know, after I left the Chromags and we started making music videos, I've suddenly had this great sense of satisfaction and and pride all the time, which I didn't have when I was in the band, or I had every once in a while. So. Yeah. Now I feel like I'm accomplishing that again with this music because I put into it exactly. I, I, I don't put it out until it's done. You know, I, I don't. I, 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 and when it's done, I have a complete sense of, of pride and and uh, and joy and, and all those things. And and in terms of packaging it for 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 fans, I will certainly do a EPs. You know, I, I I'll use the band Muse as a as a. Uh, as an example, they, they put out these EPs and at some point, you know, they re release an album collections or, you know, the way Susie and the Banshees did with the singles, you know, they, they did that album with the singles. I'll certainly do collections at some point, but I will never wait two years, five years or like Metallica does five years or something like that and put out an album's worth of music. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I don't for, think for, for many. It's in our, it's an archaic, it's an archaic form at this point. I mean, even, it just seems like in the world we live in now, even, and I'm not comparing what we do in Antidote NYHC, but we just put out a four song, seven inch, and we're basically did a video for every song and we're, all, we're over it already. And we're moving, we're going to go record, like, you know, keep it moving. To, 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 we don't want to do a, do a full length of what? Of 15 song, 20, 15 songs? Like for what? It's an astro it's an astronomical task to take on, and the, the only reason artists were ever pressured into doing that is so corporations yes, package right. it and sell it and yeah. keep you and keep you yeah. on a, on an album cycle so they can continuously make money. It's just it's an archaic infrastructure. It's it's absolutely it's, except for some. I mean, there's some out there that still you know still sort of exist, but they're dinosaurs, Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus. You but, know, but it's not the way I want to do things. The way I want to do things is is just make stuff that I love to make. Like, you know, I, I can't tell you how, what a pleasure it was making this video, you know, spending the hours and hours and people say, Oh, you're crazy for spending that kind of, I could never do that. Well, of course you could. If you had, if you had written this song and recorded yeah. this song and had that kind of pride, you would want to put just as much effort into making a music video. If you were capable, I just have, this is just something I do. I'm, you know, I, it's one of the arts skills that I have in my toolbox, and of course, I'm gonna I'm gonna employ every effort to promote my music the best way I can. And that's what, and I'll and, and, I'll and I, I can I can relate to that absolutely with the show that I do and and with the book that I just put out. And again, 100% relate to that. You know, it's it's an interesting world that we live in. Where hey, I do a show a couple times a month. I didn't set out to do it. I do it. I'm fairly good at it. Um, I've, I've got into the groove. I love doing it. People love, you know, people love the show. I'm very fortunate and, and it brings an incredible amount of satisfaction as opposed to going out and dealing with a whole bunch of people and dealing with a bunch of friggin' headaches, you know, which is, you know, what, what a lot of it is, you know? So can you hear me? Did you freeze? I think Paris froze up on me. Um, oh, he said he's he's restarting the computer. Okay. Well, wow. What has it been? An hour and 23 minutes, patrons. What's happening? <laughs> if you're still here and you're hanging in this long, I just want to say this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live, but not live. And I want to shout out our sponsors, New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, 
Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, and Generation Records. Um, talking to Paris Mayhew today. And uh, it's great to speak to him about his new City Kids release. Just chopping it up, talking film talk and, and music talk. We're waiting for him. He's going to sign back on it in, in, in a couple of minutes. So, uh, you know, that said, um, hey, <laughs> hey, yeah, I did a sponsor break. <laughs> yeah, 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 it, it was good. But, but yeah, that, that's, that's great, man. You know, this world. Well, this also, world, to continue on that, that thing is like now that the, 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 the music is established and I've got two videos out there kind of like laid groundwork for everything. Now the door is open to um, to assemble a band for live shows. Yeah. So, you know, if there's any amazing players out there uh, that are interested in participating, you know, send me something that's, you know, I, like, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan to have keyboards. I just kind of stumbled onto it. So I don't really know what I plan to have. I, you know, I'm assuming it's going to be guitar, bass, drums, piano. Um, but I'm definitely open for anything. Somebody asked me the other day, you're going to have a singer. And I was like, well, I didn't plan on having piano and don't plan on having violin, but you know, it, I follow, I'm like a monkey with shiny objects. I just follow uh, where things take me, you know, like this song, you know, this, this song led me, you know, I, I never would have had piano if my father hadn't given me that piano and Barblin hadn't sure. hired a piano teacher and Dirk wasn't, you know, the, the awesome player that he is. It just kind of, developed into that and that's why it's going to be with the live i have i have a couple i have a couple of drummer prospects and once i have that person in position anything else is possible and i've you know been speaking to people about doing live shows and it's all in the works well it's nice to be able to organically you know go wherever wherever it leads you and not be um con you know in the constraint of sort of i'm locked into this thing with three other guys and we have you know I mean, I'll never, well, I hope to never be that way. I, I, I never want to feel locked in. I mean, I always did in the past with almost every musician I ever played with, but you know, part of the, the whole thing of presenting this as, as, as what it is now, you know, with a singular musical voice, you know, the only, t the only, you know, there will never be an aggros without me. Yeah. yeah. Simple as that. Right. Well, good. That was great, man. You want to, uh, you, you want to, do you need to shout anybody out? I mean, you kind of covered a lot. Anybody, um, anything coming up or anything like that? Um, well, you know, I just released this song yesterday, so that, that is coming up. Uh, you know, just the, the most important thing you can do for a DIY artist like myself is to support it in a new way. And the, the and the powerful way is to subscribe to the U YouTube page. I know people, you always see people like asking for that, and it seems like this abstract thing. But when con when I start doing concerts, the odd thing is promoters now they don't listen to your records or look it for a magazine article. They go to YouTube or Instagram and they see how many followers you have. What are your stuff. analytics? Yeah, and they're like, oh, this guy has a buttload of of subscribers. We should book him. Oh, and we're gonna have to pay him more because he has this many. So, you know, if you want to support the music, subscribe. It's just a click of a button. It's yeah. really simple. It's really easy. And if you really want to support the music, it's something you can do that that takes no effort. So you should do it. Absolutely. And uh, if you're watching, we've put it up a couple times. Instagram at the underscore agros. Also at Paris Mayhew. Uh, YouTube.com slash the agros. And, of course, Paris Mayhew SOC is on Facebook. So, hey, thank you so much. That was cool. We, we, we chopped it up and, and uh, we, we, we kept it on topic. <laughs> yeah, no, I loved it. I, you know, I could talk about, I could, you know, I could yeah, go yeah. through that. We could start it from the head and have a completely different conversation now. We could. That's, we could. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Ha all right. I'm, uh, hang out a second. I'm, I'm going to end the show, but I want to talk to you. Uh, right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we, will, we'll, we will see you soon. Um, I won't, I won't mount, announce the next show. We got actually, if you watch this right away, Adam and the Metal Hawks is up tomorrow. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Until then, do good things and good things will come to you. Yeah.